Well, first off, it's it's rare that I meet someone that's a genuine multi instrumentalist. Um, you know, and 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 I've seen you know you both live and in, in footage playing you know guitars, keyboards, mandolins, this, that, and the other. What I'm wondering is, when you're crafting a song, what influences what you pick up? It's usually whatever is closest. <laughs> um, Honestly, you know, I mean, you can't drag a B3 to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> so if there's an acoustic guitar around, that's usually a pretty good go-to thing. You write different songs with different instruments, I think. You mm -hmm. know, if you've written on an acoustic guitar for a while, it's good to pick up an electric. It's good to do it like tune the E down to a D, change up the tuning, move over to a mandolin. You write a whole different song on a mandolin. Mm -hmm. I've got like reams of songs that I've written on keyboards that nobody's ever really heard. Okay. So most of the stuff that you hear of mine is written either on a guitar or so far away from any instrument at the time that it's being constructed that it's it's a crapshoot as to what it's going to be on. <laughs> what do you mean? Like you sing it into a tape recorder or no, something? No, I just, or? it's like, my feeling these days is if it's a good song, you should be able to try to remember it. You should mm -hmm. work hard to remember all the parts. Mm -hmm. So it'll come to me, you know, maybe I'm drifting off to sleep, something like that. I'll try to make a some sort of recording of what I'm hearing or write down the words and write down what I think the chords are going to be. It's a little bit like that automatic writing thing when you wake up in the morning and it's like, what does this say? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, and the fact that I am able to be conversant on a couple of different uh, instruments is helpful too. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I can, I can switch. If it doesn't work, I can do that. You know, change it to another instrument, or I can put a cape on a guitar and try a different key. Yeah. You know, things okay. like that. I'm a lot more open nowadays to trying different things with songs rather mm -hmm. than just going with the initial uh, feeling of what it should be. Okay. Do you mean do you mean that you purposely like you come up with a song idea and you purposely try and push it into something else, or is the initial idea often very different from a, a typical song? Well, I would. One thing that has always been leveled at the DBs, uh, either as criticism or as faint praise, is that we were kind of slaves to our demos. <laughs> and um, I grew up in a recording atmosphere with Mitch Easter and Chris Stamey, who mm. were early. Tascam TAC 2340 adoptees, uh, and they had the four-track reel-to-reel seven-inch recorders um, for, for years, and got real again conversant with the format. That's why both of them are really good producers now. Now I caught on to that, and I learned a little bit, but it was a little bit more like a field recorder, you know, yeah. um, uh, and just I didn't really care about mic positions and stuff. So I'd sort of learn to do full demos of songs. And I've had to sort of mentally scale myself back and say, that's great that you can do all that stuff, but does it really complete the song or is it just kind of a, 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 a placeholder until you figure out what the song is really gonna do? Mm -hmm. And so my idea now is to go back and see if I can't just play it on electric guitar or just play it on piano mm -hmm. and see if it holds up. Or okay. see if I were just, play, you know, Again, another song writing tool is move to a bass. You yeah. know, bass is great. You start writing entirely different things. You've got a melody, you've got a bass. Mm -hmm. What are the chords going to be? Yeah. So. Right. And then, but with your most recent album, Game Day, you did um, an approach that I, uh, I often associate with Adrian Ballou in that you played pretty much everything on it. Um, yes. And I'm wondering, you know, how much is that, you know, oh, I want it exactly like this, and how much of it is just expediency? And, and how much is, nobody will play with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, a lot of it is the first. You know, I have real plans for songs. You know, I, I know that sounds antithetical to what I just said about scaling back with the songs, but I do go into it thinking, well, wouldn't the bass part be nice on this note or right about here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I try to get that down in some sort of form. Realistically, game day could be construed as a bunch of my demos. <laughs> and I wouldn't say that you were very wrong, but I do always try to make my demos 
into rec recordings that are worth hearing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like I I, I understand that there's a uh, a flow that doesn't happen when one person is playing the drums and they're also playing the bass and they're also playing the guitar and no amount of digital hoodoo you can put with uh, delays or trying to sync stuff up oh boy I tried to sync some drums up <laughs> <laughs> kids <laughs> don't do that at home ever um, uh. but you know I mean expediency is true uh, you know, I worked in a studio in the basement of my home trying to do it in times where I wasn't going to disturb the family. Mm -hmm. um, and I had always wanted to make a record like that. But now that I've done it, I see the foibles thereof and the fact that it does sound a little fictitious. And I understand that. I think the songs shine through great. I think the songs are great. I think if I had a budget like we had in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Remember the 80s? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Remember budgets? <laughs> yeah. um, I would, you know, it'd be great to have a, a, a full contingent of musicians. And I suppose I could have done this this time, but uh, maybe I'll do that with the next one. Yeah. Hard to say. Although, it, it, it's funny because I'm in the midst of reading uh, the Keith Richards' autobiography. That's a great book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's been fascinating, but one of the fascinating things I just stumbled across the other day was he talked about Satisfaction, the version we all know and love, mm -hmm. was really the demo version of Satisfaction, and that they had intended to like add horns and all this kind of stuff to it. Boy, cooler um, heads prevail, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I, just, but I, mean, I just heard that song on the radio the other day, and I was just thinking, that's a remarkable sounding piece of work because you've got all these different sonic hooks with the guitars and if you think about horns and stuff I'd be like well, what would they do what could you you know or or in the words of somebody who was listening to some demos and clucking his tongue and mm -hmm. shaking his head I, I can't think of anything to improve on that right you know I mean it's a beautiful piece of work you listen to listen to something like um, she loves you mm -hmm. You know, I don't I don't gravitate to early Beatles all that much. I usually usually start somewhere around Rubber Soul, but early Beatles are fascinating to me now. She loves you is so short. It's got so many different hooks in it, all just one after the other. Different instruments take the spotlight at different moments. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's wonderful to be able to do that. And and that's another problem of doing all your own stuff is that you don't have anybody to say. Well, there, cowboy. Right. That's not that's not a really great idea. You may want to regret that later. Right. Um, uh, you may not be able to regret that later if you release it as is. So I don't have regrets about game day. I think but, it's. But I mean, I think the 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 the, the satisfaction example yeah. speaks to the idea that what you did with with game day was was you know worthy of that shot in the sense that so many times things get overproduced yeah. after the demo stage. And, you know, this just had this, you know, very visceral kind of, you know, uh, uh, tone to it that well, might have gotten polished the out. The immediacy of it, the need to get these songs into some sort of audible form outside of my head. Um, I, I'm inspired by people like Prince who would start and finish a song in one day from mm. creation to mixing. Yeah. You know, I just thought that was just brilliant. I love the idea that there's a raft of ABBA songs sitting someplace finished, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I'm hoping nobody will come along and remix my stuff after I'm dead. Yeah. But who, who knows? Right, right. <laughs> it could happen. Um, I just, I want to keep tapping the muse right now. I, I feel that it's not abandoned me. I feel like I should vary things up a little bit. I just turned 64 yesterday and I'm very, Happy birthday. thank you, I'm very pleased that I've made it to 64 and I'm still feeling creative and fairly relevant, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's hard to be relevant when you have a 12 year old and a 16 year old in the house. <laughs> just saying. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's like that old line Billy Crystal when he had a teenage daughter and said uh, she came up to him one day and said, Dad, is it true Paul McCartney was in a group of four wings? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had to deal with that in a real life basis at a record store in New York, but we won't talk about that. Okay. Either. All right. Yeah. But uh, along, staying along the lines of um, 
the demo, the rough cut versus the polished one? Because a lot of the artists you've worked with, where you've helped fill out their sound, be it R.E.M., Hootie and the Blowfish, Indigo Girls, you could argue they have a very polished sound. You know, oh, what, yeah. what, what comes out is very polished. Game Day has rough edges all over the place. And I'm curious, for you, is that like two sides of the same coin? Like, yes, I am the polished guy, I am the rough guy, or, well, this is really me. It probably is really me, but, but I like to think that I have the polish in me, the ability to um, adapt to whoever, whomever I'm playing with. I, you know, my business card for years said, I make you sound more like you do. <laughs> um, That's great. I don't particularly love uh, auteur, uh, you know, imprints on stuff. You know, I, th I think, I think it's okay on films if you're a director, but I think if you're a, if you're a, a, a person that's sitting in on a recording of somebody else's, your job is to make them sound as good as they can be and not about putting your own imprimatur on it somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I just don't, I, I think that that, uh, I, I've always been influenced by Ben Montanche, who oh, is the Heartbreakers, Tom who and the Heartbreakers. is a wonderful example of a chameleon-like player, yet you always pretty much know it's Ben Mont. Um, he's, it's, it's simple, it's elegant, it's direct, it's poignant, it's, it's never anything short of soulful. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet, it can be on anybody's record, mm -hmm. you know. And it's just it just works, and I like doing that. I I like having that as a kind of a a, a, a touchstone as far as what I try to do. Um, and and yeah, I'd love it if I could if every record I could make sounded like a million bucks, I'd be great. <laughs> I I don't know that it would change anything. You still have the the um, the, the general um, uh, liability of my lead singing. <laughs> so, <laughs> that keeps me from the top of the charts. <laughs> I know that. It's okay. But I like the songs, you know? I yeah. mean, it's, to me, it's about getting the songs out now. Mm -hmm. To me, it's about having a way to keep these songs going. Because if the muse is not shutting off, then far be it from me to stop receiving them you know yeah. Tom Petty's thing was it's like reaching out in the air and grabbing the song mm -hmm. and it is uh, you know I mean I don't know yesterday I sat down I hadn't we've moved and I've all, all my stuff all my recording stuff's in storage which is a little frustrating mm -hmm. but it will get sorted out but I grabbed my Telecaster and I sat down without plugging it in on the couch made some chord shapes and just kind of followed it down I was like that's pretty good <laughs> and then I, and then I actually made a little demo of it, and I haven't listened to it yet, and I'm hoping it still sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. But it was something new, and it was 2020, and it was my birthday, and it was a little present to me <laughs> from myself, and I just feel like it's not done, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I don't have any kind of delusions about whatever level of acceptance or success or any of that stuff that will ever happen for me. Mm. I don't I don't need that anymore. I had I needed that for a long time. I needed a lot of you know, oh gosh, that's great stuff. Uh, you know, if I had if I had a dollar for every in a better world the DBs would be at the top of the, you know, I yeah. would have a million dollars. Right. And could be at the top of the charts. I could buy my way there. But <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't matter anymore. Right now it's for me it's about the satisfaction of being able to do it. And to feel it, and to enjoy it, and to improve on it, to mm -hmm. constantly look toward improving and changing. Maybe that's why I'm sh sort of shifting the parameters a little bit. Yeah. But I think it keeps you fresh too. I think you know. I mean, I don't know how many songs I've written on mandolin, but I could certainly try to write more. You know, mm -hmm. and it would probably be a good exercise. It's all good to keep exercised. You know, I'm mm -hmm. learning that about my body at 64. Also, you have to keep exercising. Okay. You can't just sit there and vegetate, Yeah, you know, telecaster be damned, <laughs> you're still on the couch, buddy, get up. So, 
Yeah, and but it's funny because the, one of the interesting quotes uh, I read from you was uh, you said, I have all the qualities of a successful rock musician except for abiding ambition. Yeah, pretty much. Um, although, you know, there's people out there that have talent and, and, and have tons of ambition, but that's not... That's not an assurance of success or top of the charts or any of that kind of thing either. I, so. Well, yeah, but I tend to think that people who are self-starters in this business are people who have made the opportunities for themselves to move ahead. I think that you have to do that. I think that, I think that you can ride along for a long time on somebody else's ambition. And you know, you be the be the jovial sidekick or whatever it is that you are, mm -hmm. you know. But when it comes time to strike out, you should do that. You know, I, I look back now and I think when the DBs called a halt to existing, um, and I got that really nice gig with REM, and then immediately after REM fell in with the Drifters, and then fell in with uh, Hootie and. Et cetera, et cetera, um, and I just I never kind of gave the solo thing a lot of credence. Mm -hmm. I never gave much thought to being a solo artist. My friend Chris Stamey, who left the DBs after the second album, has had a long and varied and fascinating and satisfying solo career, mm. constantly growing, you know, constantly producing, keeps looking down the road a mile, you know, so he knows what he's coming into. I, I admire that tremendously. I just never had that. I never could get that part of it happening. Mm. You know, I relied on management for opportunities. That's great, up to a point, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you have, to, you have to want to do it. I mean, I wanted to do it, and at the time I couldn't really reconcile why I wasn't getting all this deserved, you know, in a better world. Mm attention, yeah. um, mainly in terms of commercial sales. You know, we got great reviews. The five, we had a 500 pound press kit, yeah. without a doubt. But and that and a quarter gets mom a call, yeah. you know? So, and also clearly it, it influenced other people because all the bands you've mentioned, you know, they, they were influenced by your work in the DBs and knew about you because of your work in the DBs. I find that every day now. You know, I'm surprised. I met Patterson Hood from the drive-by truckers the other night at the cradle. And he was just testifying about like this and having seen the DBs opening for REM on tour. And I was like, wow, that's so nice to hear mm -hmm. that, that it made, you know, you don't know. When you're in a band, unless you're the Eagles yeah. or Hootie and the Blowfish or REM, you don't really have a clear uh, focused vision of what the impact of your songs is on people. You know, you will have people come up to you and say, I love that song, or my mom and dad turned me onto your record, yeah. or, or um, I love that cover of your song. And that's always so great to hear, but it's like, it's, it's a little hit or miss, you know? Yeah. I, can't, I can't set my calendar by it, certainly, but I, I, um, but I just don't know, you know? I mean, the, and, and you have to think about that in terms of like reviving the brand, right? Mm. Like, do we put the DBs back together and do a tour? Would anybody come? Mm. Would we do it? I mean, we did a record in 2012, I think, yeah. like Falling Off the Sky, which is a great record, but mm. it didn't really have, again, had virtually no impact. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, you know? Do, yeah. It's, if they didn't come the first time, are they going to come the second time? Um, I don't know. But I mean, and also it's, it speaks to how people often find out about be, uh, other artists through maybe more mainstream artists. Yeah. You know, in the sense of, like the first time I heard about you, uh, um, I saw that concert film by Hootie called Summer Camp with Trucks. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the avuncular presence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I still am to a degree. <laughs> But because I, I, I remember all the, the the behind the scenes stuff, which I loved geeking out over, and part of it was them 
pulling you onto the camera and just, you know, hey, this is Peter Halsab, but we're really excited to have him on the tour. And that was my first introduction. I'm like, oh, I got to check this guy out and find out what he's about kind of thing. And But I love... I love that's even before Wikipedia. Yeah, no, I know. I had to do it the old-fashioned way. Oh gosh, but I love that you can. (laughs) But I love that you know uh, um, influences and connections and this bizarre you know family tree can take you into such uh, interesting aspects like that. Oh, I hear you. You know, I mean, the I, I think about the generation of musicians that I came up with. You know, groups. I mean, the Bush Tetras from mm-hmm. New York are this wonderful noisy rock band um, that in 1981 we played a, a, cl- a, a venue called the Rainbow in London. Mm. It's a sort of famous bigger hall. And it was us and a group called the Bongos and the Flesh Tones and the Bush Tetras and the Ray Beats mm-hmm. and the DBs and a group called Polyrock who were on RCA. Hmm. Okay. And that was that was almost 40 years ago. And the Bush Tetras are celebrating their 40th anniversary as a band hmm. on Friday. And I'm so excited to see that. I see all these people that I came up with in New York still relevant, still making beautiful records. Pat Irwin from the Ray Beats and Eight-Eyed Spy has this group called Sus hmm. that's gorgeous with a couple of the guys from Rubber Rodeo, if you remember them. Really? And um, oh, just all kinds of, it's like ambient country music. <laughs> it is, it is, wow. I kid you okay. not, S-U-S-S, definitely yeah. worth your while. Right. Um, and, but I see this, and I see my friends in Winston-Salem that I grew up with as a kid. And you know, all these people are still playing music, and some of them are playing to 40th anniversary shows, and some of them are playing at the bar on the corner and, you know, with a big screen TV showing the Carolina game in yeah, the background. Yeah. Right. You know, so, but they're playing, and, and I am too, and that's exciting to me. I think, uh, you know, that we, we get to do this, and we, you know, as Ray Charles said, retire to what? You're right. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I would retire to. Mm-hmm. I mean, if I couldn't play, that'd be one thing, but yeah. I just, I get, I'm getting more out of it now than I ever have. I think once I once I unloaded all those career expectations mm-hmm. and got down to just like, oh, this, yeah, it was a lot better for my mental health and for, you know, my friends around me and my family and maybe not my bank account, but yeah, right. that's okay. Well, I mean, that also brings up you know, you took, what was it, a year off, two years off. Mm-hmm. Uh, you worked uh, with our own local Durham Performing Arts That's Center. Right. And, you know, kind of somewhat musically checked out for a time. What I'm wondering is, how were you different as a musician when you returned to music? I think that goes back to what I was just saying as far as the, you know, getting the, getting the expectations out of the way and not having that as a sticking point. I found that when I took the break and I worked for Bob Klaus at Deepak as management assistant, that I had to do work for them. I didn't have time for music. I had to throw myself into that job. I was doing a lot of things uh, with trade and with the playbill and with any number of different, you know, the, the educational mm-hmm. uh, part of the side of things. And, you know, Bob took me on. I didn't know anything about the job. He took me on because he was a fan and thought I could do the job. Mm -hmm. And I did, and I did a pretty good job of it. But I did realize that all that time that I spent working for Deepak was the time that I would have otherwise been doing music. And somewhere along the line, it it occurred to us that it would probably be good if I stopped working at Deepak and went back to doing full-time music. Mm -hmm. Not because I was going to have any sort of meltdown, but just because that was where my heart lies. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and it was getting evident that I was getting a little itchy to do that, I have to say. I, um, when I stopped playing for a while, I had auditioned to play with Darius's country band, mm-hmm. and that didn't work out, and probably for the better for me. Okay. Um, I would have been working a long, long time with him, which would have been great. Darius is a great boss and band leader, and obviously, any chance you get to be part of the frame of that picture, it's just a, a, a privilege. But mm-hmm. I just, um, you know, I wanted to play rock and roll. So, mm-hmm. so when I, when everything came to a head and I left, I started getting cracking on game day. 
Yeah. And it was time. And it was very evident that it was time. And I just was like, my patience had run out. I had to rock. Okay. And do, do, I, do I sound like D. Snyder? <laughs> 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 Who is a very smart and good man. <laughs> he is. I've actually gotten to meet him a couple of times. And oh, he's okay. just really incredibly bright and stood up for rock music at the PMRC mm. uh, hearings. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Among other things. So. And then, well, I'm also wondering, you know, because, you know, you, you, you've done the, done the solo project, but again, you've done a lot of work supporting other people and helping them fill out their mm -hmm. sound. Um, and it's become, I mean, that's a talent in its own right, I feel. And I'm curious, what does it take to be that guy for another band? Well, for me, it is knowing how to play a lot of different instruments. Um, specifically stringed and keyboard. Um, being able to be conversant on both instruments, both style of instruments, has definitely gotten me more gigs if I, than if I had just one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what really would help somebody trying to do that, if we we're going to talk about career guidance, is to be sure you learn how to read music somewhere in there. I did not. It has been uh, a hindrance to my ability to get some gigs or to <laughs> read sheet music when put in front of me. Yeah. It's like the old joke, how do you get a guitar player to turn down, put a sheet music in front of him? <laughs> <clears throat> um, so that would, be, that would have made my job easier. Ben Mott can read. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy named Andy Burton who has played with all sorts of people. He's actually played with the DBs and played keyboards for us sometimes. Most recently was with um, Cindy Lauper and with Little Steven and the Disciples oh, of Soul. Mm -hmm. That guy can read, 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 read. Mm -hmm. You know, Charles Cleaver around here, great reader, mm -hmm. you know, great improviser. Yeah. So um, I just never did because my elder brother who did read and was a classically trained pianist and organist told my parents not to get me any lessons because quote, he knows what he's doing. Well, he did know what he was doing, <laughs> but he could have used a little bit of the nomenclature or numericlature or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. But it is good to be able to look at an instrument and say, what else plays like that? I play guitar. Can I play bass? You got a 12 string? Got a nylon string guitar? Mm. Got a tenor guitar? Got a resonator guitar? Oh, lap steel. Yeah, lap steel. Pedal steel? Can you do pedal steel? Mm. Banjo? Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, some, some instruments like pedal steel and banjo and sitar are yeah. best left in the hands of the experts. Oh. There's a reason why a lot of those require lifelong disciplines. Okay. Um, pedal steel, I had no idea. Hmm. Boy, I had one of those things. I had an ancient Fender pedal steel when I lived in Los Angeles. I mean, just, there's knee levers and pedals and volume pedals and you got to put two together and make sure your bar is straight across and okay. in tune. <sighs> yeah, because it so, doesn't look like much when you see a guy playing. It's just, you know, just you see slight movements of the hands. Yeah, the I'll tell you what, um, <clears throat> lap steel is a lot more forgiving mm -hmm. when you don't have all those pedals and stuff like that and you can kind of scooch into the note if you're just creasing beneath it. Um, but I love doing all that stuff. I love, you know, I can, I, I, I learned to play bottleneck guitar too. I can do lap steel or bottleneck. Mm -hmm. um, I can get my way around in a harmonica. Uh, I uh, was the, one of the few non-Cajun, non-Zydeco accordion players in New Orleans mm -hmm. for a while. So I got rock gigs <laughs> on accordion. Um, I hope that doesn't count against me. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the fact that I can do all that has made me an appealing quantity to people, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so, good. Yeah. I, I suggest that to anybody. If you've got, you got a house full of instruments, it's like kids taking clarinet. God help you with the reeds. And the, <laughs> get a flute. Get, a, get an alto sax around, too. See if there's something that they want to double on, you mm -hmm. know. My son plays trombone. He can play some trumpet, you know. He played on your album. Yes, he did. He played trombone on the album. And he's good. He's the head of the uh, trombone section for the Northern Marching Knights at Northern High School and has been for a couple of years. Wow, okay. So, you know. Yeah. But 
He's also pretty pragmatic. He said, Dad, I could see being a musician, but trombone? All right. <laughs> I said, dude, what you need to do is put together a Tijuana Brass tribute band. Yeah. <laughs> you will make buku bucks, and people will eat that up. Right. And you got the sombrero already. So. <laughs> but anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, my life's been a dichotomy, mm -hmm. musically speaking, because here's this guy that writes the songs and makes the records that don't sell a lot, okay. but are good. Mm -hmm. And then here's this guy that plays with R.E.M. and with Hootie and is, you know, 650,000 seats sold a summer. Yeah. That's not too slouchy. No. But it's like, but that's a different guy. You know, this is what I do and this is what I sort of live for. And somewhere in the middle of it all, that's when you have your own band, I guess, where you can do all of it together. So, right, right. And then open for people like Hootie. Yeah. So. And then, but I'm wondering also, like guidance you provided, if only because, um, so you played guitar on Losing My Religion. On That's the right, RM acoustic album. guitar. Two years ago, uh, I saw you at Hootie's Homegrown shows down in South Carolina, and they covered Losing My Religion. I'm curious, number one, what kind of guidance did you give them for that tune? You know, especially readjusting it for a very different singer in that case. And then two, was it a chance for you to maybe try something different with your own parts of that song? Well, actually, no. We tried to fairly recreate the R.E.M. version. They are, as you probably know, diehard R.E.M. fans, which is where they found me mm -hmm. when I was playing with R.E.M. in Columbia. And they, when they got signed, the guy that signed them said, do you want anybody to come out and play? Well, we'd like to get somebody like Peter Hull's apple. So he says, hold on. And he called me. I yeah. was delivering flowers. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think I can do that. Um, no, but the, the, um, the uh, Darius has a voice that is not too dissimilar to the timbre of Michael's. Really? I think. I think they're both lower tenors, upper baritone you know if you listen to um, michael is not a high singer all the time and i th and and we sing it it's all done in the same key okay so darius is in the same key and he's not straining on that at all um he uh you know he, he could sing the phone book yeah he really just he did a thing with us years ago with the continental drifters my other band and we did a tribute to sandy denny the great folk rock vocalist from england and got Darius to come up and sing Black Waterside, and he just owned it. It was so great. And this mm. beautiful big old church in Brooklyn, St. Anne's, oh, gorgeous. But yeah, I mean, the, the, they have actually recorded a version of that as well. Mm. And I mean, for me, it's really funny because it's sort of like reliving the dream, you know, right? Out yeah. there with the same guitar part and everything. So. Right. And it's also, it's nice because usually that's when they introduce me in a show, so. Yeah, I'm yeah. good. I'm good with that. All right. <laughs> you may not know what else I do, but you know who I am right now. <laughs> and then uh, when I was researching, one other thing I came across, which uh, I loved, um, was you in a previous interview were lamenting the disappearance of liner notes uh -huh. with albums. And um, I totally get it. I mean, I'm, I was so excited uh, the first time uh, I was ever in liner notes for an album. Actually, a band you once worked with, Cowboy Mouth, okay. uh, put me in there. Um, and it's still exciting for me today. And it means a lot. And I was the kid that used to pour over yeah. liner notes. Um, from your perspective, what's lost with, with disappearing liner notes? I think that it's important to know who made the music? I think it's hard to get a sense of that beyond a general picture of the artist. You know, when MTV came along versus CMT, I remember when they would show videos, um, they would show Ari uh, the, uh, the, they, they'd list the director of the video mm. on the, uh, the, the credits. MTV credits, but in the CMT they would list the songwriter. Oh. And I thought that was a real specifically different kind of thing. I think when I remember back days of sitting around with a record like Kink Chronicles, the two LP Kinks, uh, anthology that came out in the 70s on Warner Brothers reprise and it's got this copious 
single spaced, no pictures, <laughs> liner notes by John Mendelssohn, who was a, 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 a writer at Cream Magazine and very florid. He's mostly known at this point as the guy that gave the bad review to the first Led Zeppelin record in Rolling oh. Stone. <laughs> but he spent years writing these brilliant, brilliant pieces. And, and, they, and it's just like, you know, I'm 15, 14, 15 years old. I'm reading this stuff. I'm like, <laughs> I need this record. I need this record. I need to hear this. This is all on here. This is great. But what is this Village Green Preservation? I yeah. get to, need to get Arthur. What do I need to find out with this stuff? So for me, it was guidance to get me to the other places that I needed to go. You know, listening to uh, uh, and, and reading the credits on a John Mayle on the Blues Breakers album and seeing Otis Rush and thinking, okay, I know Otis Rush's name from a Mike Bloomfield record. Okay, well, we needed like kind of, so, and then you get into Otis Rush from mm -hmm. there. You know, in, in a lot of ways, having had that generation of the Stones and the Animals and the Electric Flag and the Butterfield Blues Band and John Mayall to kind of guide us into their roots, we got that, or Kerner Rain Glover even, the, 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 the three acoustic guys from Minneapolis that were all friends of Dylan's. Oh. They did three great records on, of acoustic blues on Electra. But it's like for those of us that didn't really have access to a Lead Belly record or to a Robert Johnson record, or Otis Rush record at the time, this was our guideway in. And the same thing with, you know, I mean, rock records too. Just not seeing any credits on those things anymore. Or not, you know, I mean, people are down, it's a different economy because it's the single driven track, download, you don't really need to own it. So why would you need to have any of the information with it? But the information is still congruent to what you're listening to if you like how that piano player plays, mm -hmm. I wonder who it is. Oh, it's Ben Montanch. I'd loved him and Tom Petty. And what else has he played? Bob Dylan, you know? It's like reading Ghost Star. What you, you can't make those connections without the information. Mm -hmm. You can't see, I think it was a Julie Burchill's Rock's Rich Tapestry, you know? But it is all, it cinches tighter and tighter if you look at all these things. I found out something the other day I'd never known. This is gonna get, so obscure, you may fall off your stool. <laughs> There's a guy named Swamp Dog. Okay, don't know. Swamp Dog is also known as Jerry Williams. Great songwriter, wrote a song called Total Destruction to Your Mind, hmm. which is a great rock and roll song. Okay. But back in his earlier days, he wrote and produced a Gene Pitney song called She's a Heartbreaker, which was Gene's last US hit, and features, oddly enough, an electric sitar on bass. Huh. But it's a brilliant song. You can find that on YouTube too. And okay. Jerry Williams wrote and produced that. And I didn't know. And I love that. And I'm 63 years old when I find this out. And it's okay, you know? <laughs> it's like I'm catching up. There's still more stuff. There's still more music to be listened to mm -hmm. and stuff to read while you're listening to it. Okay. I mean, for me, that was half of the fun, yeah. you know, getting to read all this stuff. And how disappointing it was when a record didn't have, you know, what is it? Dave Mason and Mama Cass. Great record, but it's like gatefold sleeve. Mm -hmm. Dave, Cass, yeah. Dave, Cass, and right. <laughs> right. you were going to tell us something about who played? Yeah. You, know, you can go to Discogs.com. That's been very helpful. Yeah. You know, you can find, yeah, Discogs, I think, is a little bit more user-friendly for actually picking out who's on what records and the cross-referencing and mm -hmm. stuff like that, you know. If By the way, to, if you have spare time, go on to Discogs and look up his credit history. You'll need to block off like an hour because the scroll, <laughs> the scroll bar is like that big. But still, it's it's fascinating. I've got to play with some cool people. Yeah, I have to definitely. Say, you know? But and then I also didn't want this to pass because I. Uh, you uh, want to talk about the trogs, right? <laughs> no. Well, what I wanted to say was. Uh, credit to you for creating a digital booklet that comes with your album so that there are liner notes to game day. Good. And I went through those and I'm curious, why is Jeff Beck in your liner notes when he doesn't play on the album? Uh, I'll tell you why. There are four little credits on there. Um, Jeff Beck is on there because the little blurb that I wrote about 
in today's music business, nobody's doing anything original, so we didn't. Yeah. That's actually the liner notes from Jeff Beck Group's second album, Beckola. Oh. Slightly modified to fit my purposes. <laughs> I can't remember what the other fake credits are, but there's like three other ones on there. But okay. you're the first, one, first person to ask me about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, see, I like little tricks like that too. Yeah. When I was a kid, Todd Rundgren, mm -hmm. another great solo play everything kind of guy, yeah, very put out a record called A Wizard of True Star, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful record. And it came with a postcard, a, and an addressed postcard, and it said, send this in for something exciting. So we all sent it in, right? Next record was called Todd, T-O-D-D. -T. Comes with a poster. Open up the poster. The poster is made up of a graphic that is everybody's name that sent in the postcards oh. in the tiniest, you know, gray scale kind of thing. Yeah. So many, and there's even a Facebook page for that. Oh. But you know, see, that kind of stuff, that's right. fun. That's nice. It's, it's nice for the listener to have a little bit of a reward, especially if you're a big fan of Todd's. Mm -hmm. you know, do fun things like that. It's yeah. nice. And I will just minor soapbox moment say that, you know, because I was a kid and I grew up, I, you know, would scour uh, magazines, newspapers. Mm -hmm. I think I've read the liner notes on every album I ever owned. Um, then along comes the internet and bands have their own websites. Along comes social media, bands have their own channels. And I'm still looking through magazines and newspapers to get information because musicians are just posting pictures of their lunch. And I would just like to say, that's why I don't do that with my clients. I think it sucks. Anyway. <laughs> no lunches from me. I'm really not a food guy. Um, I do, I've decided I'm gonna start posting playlists of stuff that I listen to every day. Oh, that's um, I was listening to um, Funhouse by the Stooges on the way over here and seeing if I could turn it up really loud and disturb the the people I was walking around. It doesn't have that kind of effect anymore, especially when you're a bald 64-year-old. You just look like you got your kids' songs on or something like that. But yeah, uh, social media is an interesting thing. You know, that's that's one of the things as a, as a, as a latter-day solo artist I've had to come to terms with, is that I, I need a presence there and I'm not really good at keeping a consistent presence. I think it's very worthwhile if, uh, if somebody is trying to do something like this, like I am now, try to be taken seriously again as a, a performing, recording, writing artist, that you have to have somebody who knows their social media to kind of guide you through that. Um, I don't know if it's, it's an intern or a teenage child or um, what, you know, that owes you money for, for something. Right, for uh, raising them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that coat they wanted, those <laughs> shoes. Right, I know. Um, you want to eat tonight, Timmy? All right, let's see what you can do What's with TikTok. Yes, <laughs> TikTok. Oh my God, I haven't even looked into that at this point. Yeah. Except my kids are all over that, so hard to say. But yeah. you know, I mean, I, I, I can dig it. It's, it's a lot different now. You know, it's ever since John Oates said, you know, you spend all your life trying to learn to be a musician, and all of a sudden you got to become an actor. Yeah. When the video started happening. Mm. And, uh, and that didn't work so good for him. <laughs> I keep having the visions of Jingle Bell Rock, and he just looks kind of anesthetized. In that. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's great. It's, it's sad that rock has been sort of marginalized at this point. Mm. Rock music, to a degree, has become not the biggest form of popular music. It has simply slipped off the radar to, from where it was. Pop music now is a lot different. Mm -hmm. I listen to a lot of pop music. I, you know, when you have a 12-year-old daughter, I'm t she is my gateway to things like Shawn Mendes mm -hmm. and, 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 and just beautiful stuff. The, the, what's the group, the Chainsmokers, you know? Mm -hmm. Great music. Um, I, that's the other thing I don't want to be, is an old guy that can't listen to modern music without mm. saying, I don't get Billie Eilish. I don't know. <laughs> What's that all about, man? <laughs> I gave her three songs, man. <laughs> really? You know, I mean, we have to understand that the music that our kids are listening to is their music. It's okay for them to like it. We're not supposed to like it. We didn't particularly love Andy Williams. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did, but we didn't admit it. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't listen to it all the time. Yeah. You know. Um, so 
we were fortunate to have our time of all those beautiful records and the fact that they're mostly available now either in reissue form or on YouTube somewhere, you know? The fact that there are people discovering Judy Sill now, the fact that there are people still discovering Nick Drake, mm -hmm. you know? The fact that, that we're even talking about John Mayall and the Blues Breakers yeah. in 2020, this staying power is there. It's just not getting a lot of new young fans, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yeah. You know, we had our moment in the sun. We can still do it too. And I plan on playing until the wheels drop off. So. <laughs> cool. Well, that's, that covers all my material. Is there anything we didn't discuss that you want to talk about? Um, I wouldn't mind talk, addressing a little bit about the, the state of economics for musicians and songwriters these days, if it's all right to get into that briefly. That's fine. JP, are you cool if we keep rolling for... No, no, no. Okay. Um, I, it occurs to me that getting a start in this business also in 2020 is hobbled by a lack of a way of making sure you can have an income from it. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a rich rock star. Sure, who didn't? You saw the Beatles, you saw Ringo buy a house for his mom and dad. I wanted to do that, you know? Who didn't? Um, and there was a time when you could do that. And then there was a time when, you know, you had to be Bonnie Raitt and be out there 300 days a year um, doing shows uh, mm -hmm. to this college audience, right? Or yeah. Jay Giles or Joe Cocker at a certain level, you know? And you couldn't get to the, the highest of the high because that's Springsteen or Michael Jackson or something like that. And then, you know, now it's, it's like, how did the Strokes afford to rehearse in Manhattan? Right. You know, <laughs> how in God's name did they do that? You know, we, uh, how does anybody keep a band together uh, that you have to pay the instrumentalists, you know? Yeah. You have to figure out where you're gonna play. Where are you gonna play? You know, are there, the rock club situation has also been dwindling. There are places in almost every town where you can go see a rock band. And if you don't go see them, they won't have them. So it's good to keep that going. It's great to have a band in your living room, but it's also really great to play out. And if you can get that opportunity, you should do that. But don't count on the, f you know, making bank on it at this point. It helps to know how to do a bunch of different things. So much like playing 15 different instruments, if you can type, if you can code, if you've got a bachelor's degree in something, you'll always have something that you can kind of fall back on. Yeah. This is a difficult business, children. I promise you, it is not for the faint of heart or the, the, um, the, the conventionally financially challenged. <laughs> it really helps to have your act together going into this. Who did a blowfish when they signed to Atlantic? Had their 401k plan, they had their merch all done. They basically were signed on the premise that don't mess with these guys, they've got it together. So it's great if you've got somebody in your band that can do business and get that together, get your merch. They always say now, that's where the money is in merch. Hmm. It's true, you get your gas money from that. It is not from record sales. It is certainly not from streaming revenue. No. You, you know, it's exposure. People die from exposure. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, I did work with one up-and-coming band who had reached a, a, their song got a million plays on Spotify, and that weekend they had to cancel their shows because they couldn't afford to fix their van, you know, mm -hmm. so to me that was... Yes, that's... Um... But it, it also brings up a point that the, the bands that uh, I have known that um, have continued to make a living, have continued to be full-time bands, mm -hmm. um, especially ones that are no longer with big labels, are ones that understand that this is a business. Mm -hmm. And they have that other side of themselves where they know, okay, you know, here's the business side, or at least I'm gonna bring in this person who's gonna handle these business side aspects because they need to be handled. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
it's good to, it's almost like a divorced couple and a child, I think, and making some kind of arrangement so that you're all working toward the best interests of the child, the band being the child. And you know, the divorced couple may still be in the band and still working together and button heads all the time, but if you have this income generating thing that made a hit for you at some point, I see why people go out on these tours. I just saw a thing that's that's like, what was it? It's the Romantics and Wang Chung and mm -hmm. Missing Persons and yeah. and and uh, Big Country mm -hmm. and and all these people and they're all playing like 15 minutes, you know? Or, yeah. or you know, Violent Femmes I think got 30 minutes mm -hmm. and then Hammer at the end for 45 minutes. But it's like, it's if you have that moment in the sun and you do have a hit and can bank on that, that's really great. I've never had that myself. I've had a lot of songs that have been loved and well received, but none that have been a chart top in success. And so that has been uh, a difficult financial thing to get over. Um, your hope is, though, that something good like that will happen. If you can get one song in the public's consciousness somehow, then you are almost able to write your own ticket. You know, mm -hmm. from there on out, with limited, you know, expectations. Again, you're not going to go out and headline two days at Madison Square Garden, um, but you might be fifth on the bill for 15 minutes with your hit. You yeah. Know? Well, also, I think it's also come down hugely to live performance. Mm -hmm. um, can you sound good live? Can you put on a show? Can you get people not just yes. to come out once, but to come see you again? Um, Record labels for what they are in 2020 want to make sure you have all that together before you, they will even talk to you. Because if they see you as this, you know, a guy sitting at home playing into his recorder, into yeah. his c computer that doesn't really have a way of getting out there and making the songs come alive, then, you know, they're not going to want to hedge their bet on that because that's, that again is the way to sell stuff. But again, it's this whole economy of, do you make, what do you do? I mean, are you going to make an album? I made an album, right? I yeah. made CD, it's a CD, but it's an album's worth of songs. Yeah. And it's like, is that concept antique and irrelevant now? Do people really want to hear 12 of your songs? Do they have the attention span for it? Do they want, I mean, even I can't get to the end of that stupid record. <laughs> no offense, Peter. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like, that's a, it's a, that's a, it's a, it's a time thing for people. Do they have it? What, how are they listening? Are they listening on their mm -hmm. computer speakers on an MP3 with limited fidelity? Are they in their car? Are the kids chatting the whole time? What, you know, the, the distraction level from rock and roll has increased, you know? Um, you can't pay as much attention to it at this point. There's too much else noise, too much other noise going on. I yeah. Think. And your money is being pulled in different directions. How much is your Netflix? How much is your Hulu? How much do you watch TV? You know, would you rather go see a band, or is there something good on on um, uh, on uh, HBO tonight? Yeah. You know, it's comfortable. It's not cold out. But uh, you know, are you going to go? Do you want to make that commitment? It's hard to do. Yeah. People are getting pulled in every direction. But as long as there's good rock and roll out there, it can be heard and be found. And the people that are doing it are doing it because they love it, uh, not because they're getting rich off of it for the most part. So remember that. When you see it listing for a band that you want to go see, go see them. How long are they going to be a band? You never know. <laughs>